Hey, it's One American Podcast Live with Mark Eglinton, and um, we are going to talk again. This is the second time he's been on the show. We're going to talk McAfee. The only difference between this time and the last time that we spoke is I have had a chance to read the amazing uh, book, uh, No Domain, the John McAfee Tapes by Mark. And man, I got to tell you, dude, I finished it this morning. What great work. Absolutely. And I'm not just saying that because you're on the podcast, because if it sucked, I just wouldn't have you on the podcast. <laughs> it's actually good. <laughs> I'm that desperate. I probably would come on. But, uh, <laughs> here. I appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Man, I tell you what, and not only was I impressed with the story um, in hearing um, John's responses to all your questions and your conversations, but the actual writing was so good. It was so easy to easy to read. I loved the experts excerpts rather at the um, uh, throughout the book at the beginning of many of the chapters and at the end. Yeah. And I just think that you really put together something really timeless and special here, man. You did a lot of honor to his life. And, you know, it's regretful that he can't read it, but I know yeah. that he would be proud of what you've done, man. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the difficult things to explain is that when, when I was doing this, I didn't know that I'd be in this position. I think I discussed this with you last time I was on. I, I wasn't writing this book thinking John won't be here. In fact, I was writing this book thinking he would. Uh, and that's not to say that, I that there's anything I would have changed. I mean, people have asked me, would you have done anything differently if you knew that John wasn't here anymore? I.e., would you have left some stories in, some details in? I don't think I would have. I've pretty much done the same book I would have done if John was going to be here and promoting it, which was the plan. And, uh, you know, what, what you said about it in terms of kind of capturing his voice and also giving a bit of the, the narrative to guide it all is more or less what I've heard from everyone. So... I'm really excited about how it's gone down so far. Uh, mostly, you know, you'll get the occasional. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll come into that. There, there are a few <laughs> angles flying around, but I mean, in general, for people who are interested in John, the feedback's been great. Well, uh, and it sounds like, you know, at the end of the book that it was pretty explicit that he gave his blessing for you to just yeah. do your thing, you know? Yeah. And that was, that was how it was. Uh, and I never deviated from that. At no point did I want it to be a hit job. At the same time, I didn't want to let him get away with murder either, and <laughs> no pun intended. But, you know, I didn't want to – I mean, one of the – it's not a criticism, but one of the things that people have said is, you know, if John had done an autobiography, it would have just been – he would have just run away with it and spun all the stories he wanted, and you would have very little pushback on that. I now think that the format that we ended up with, whereby I could at least challenge him on some of this stuff, was vital to this book because without that, you're, you're in his hands – and as everyone knows, John's hands are, are John's hands and he does what he wants. So I, I'm very happy with the way the, for, the format turned out. And, you know, I have to say the publisher did not like the format at the beginning. He, I mean, he, he'd be the first to admit, he said, I don't see how this can work. And I said, I promise you this can work. It's the only way that it can be done. And here we are. Well, publishers are always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I wouldn't like to say that, but so I'll have to work with them again, probably. But, you know, <laughs> right, of course. I believed in it enough to say, listen, this is the way it has to be done. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, and I want to talk about John, but as I was reading this book, I couldn't help but think about the famous con artist, for lack of a better term, uh, Frank Abagnale, who's yep. famous for the movie Catch Me If You Can. Of course, he wrote the book Catch Me If You Can. Yep. And I just think, and I don't know if you'd ever have the opportunity or even the interest in doing something like that, but you would be an awesome biographer for that man's life because, you know, so much of his autobiography is now known to be bullshit. <laughs> is that right? I didn't know that. I mean, I mean, you'd almost expect that. You'd, you'd almost want it. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. There, there were some things that he, there were some cons that he claimed to have done, like like passing the Louisiana bar. And there's no record of him even at, like ever have taken the bar. Like he just said that he passed the bar, <laughs> like shit yeah. like that. <laughs> not even important. That's the really fun thing about that kind of stuff. And I'm not justifying it. It's just like sure. a throwaway lie for no reason. And yeah. uh, I find that sort of mildly titillating in some respects, but you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that lying is a good thing, but yeah, I get it. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. So in John seems like he was the same way. I, you know, I couldn't point out like any explicit lie or anything. And I, I wouldn't even describe him as a liar though. He lied a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't say that he was a liar. That's not how I characterize him in my head, but he yeah. seems like somebody who really has a lot of fun massaging the truth to make better stories. Oh yeah. I mean, hundred percent. Uh, there is one sort of editorial review out there by Stephen Miller in the Washington Examiner, which 
when I read it, it actually made me feel good, not because he said it was a good book, but because he kind of explained the McAfee style better than I possibly could have. And basically what he said was that, you know, you give John an opportunity and he turns it into the uh, sort of Terrence Malick movie. And you, you, you've got no control over what you do with that. You just let John spin tales. Now, that's not to say that the, 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 the fundamentals of those stories weren't true. But I'm pretty sure that John gathered up some details and maybe some tweets here, here, here and there along the way in these stories to make them better. And he did do that. He loved to entertain the room. And for those months, I was the room. So I think it was a big part of him that was thinking, hey, this is, this is going to be great. We're doing a book. But also, I'd like to give this guy a bit of a ride as well in terms of the stories. And we spent a lot of time laughing. There were some stories that we laughed out loud at for like minutes. Uh, there's one in particular about a guy that was on a jet ski. Uh, who came from Venezuela, and John thought he'd done really well by traveling sort of 10 miles on his jet ski, and this guy had been in one for four months or something. Anyway, that might not be true. It doesn't matter if it was true, but it was really, really funny. So, uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing it was. And I had to be on guard the whole time and say, well, I, I don't know about this story, John. And he was very convincing, and that's just how it had to be. And, you know, as Stephen Miller also said, and I don't want to date him too much in this thing, but... He said, does it matter if it was true? And well, I don't know. That's that's for people reading the book to work out. Are you willing to give them a pass on some of this stuff? I was. I also pushed back on a lot too. Well, and even if it isn't true in the literal sense, it could be true in the capital T sense. Yeah. You know, like the Bible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it, it kind of took the weight off. It took this kind of weight off me. It, it kind of freed me when he said these things. He said, because at the end of the day, who cares? Uh, yeah. Who, who cares? And that sounds really sort of amoral, like I'm sort of being sort of deciding what's right and what's wrong. It's not like that. It's a story and it's somebody's life story. And I think, you know, there has to be some license there, particularly with somebody like McAfee. Yeah. And well, and one of the things that I found so interesting about the book is when you think about um, American business moguls, yeah, you, you you typically think about not a psychopathic, but like a sociopathic sort of without conscience type person who just makes a shit ton of money, mm -hmm. incredibly narcissistic, not necessarily evil, just totally apathetic to the well being of others. And when I when I <laughs> captured when I was reading this book, I just couldn't get over how obvious it is that McAfee was an incredibly sensitive human being. Yeah. Yeah, that's for, that's for sure. And I think that's why he didn't belong in that world. You know, he, he made the point on, on more than one occasion, you know, the whole the whole idea of being a Bill Gates or a Richard Branson, something like that, just didn't, didn't appeal to him whatsoever. And the reason it didn't appeal to him, I don't think was anything to do with the business. I think the point he made to me was that if you, if you only operate at that sort of narrow band of the stratosphere, you only ever deal with people in that narrow band. So you end up in board meetings, you end up in sort of charity events, you're talking to the same kind of people. And he said, basically, these kind of people are fucking boring. And these are not the kind of people I want to spend my life talking to. I want to spend my life talking to the guys in the street. I want to spend my life talking to people in Mexican jails. I want to, you know, literally, he, he was attracted to the underbelly. So he was always pushing against this sort of career path. And it wasn't even a career path. It was unintentional. He created this position. And then when he got there, he was like, I don't want to be here. Uh, he was the antithesis of these kind of cold killer type uh, mega business types. You're absolutely right. Well, and his life, it, it, it reads like on the road by Kerouac or something. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just wild. It's, it's, it's like a Hunter S. Thompson story or something almost. And, and yeah. I, you know, I knew, I knew that he was a partier because it was made apparent when he like ran, when he ran as libertarian candidate for president, that was like part of his brand. Yeah. But I didn't realize how, uh, overwhelming the drug use was throughout his life. I mean, starting in the 60s. I mean, this is somebody who was using psychedelics to solve major problems at IBM, yeah. right? With the with 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 putting the 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 old data through the new machine, and then yeah. you know later on in his life, he said, you know, if I was on drugs, there's no way I could have figured X, Y, and Z out. And so yeah. it's funny how he was like at one part of his life, drugs were were like a fundamental necessity in order for him to solve critical thinking problems. But then later on in his life, this sort of got in the way. I don't know. It was just interesting to see that change over the decades. 
Yeah, I think the, the interesting point you made to me, I was quite fascinated by the whole idea of when sort of Silicon Valley came <laughs> I started this podcast because I noticed a concerted effort to shame America and what it means to be American. One American Podcast reinforces the values and ideals of America by having conversations with key influencers from all over the world who resonate with the values embodied by Americanism. If you believe in things like the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and want to be part of the conversation with others who do too, then you're in the right place. So before we get into this episode, I'm asking you today as one American to tap the like button below and subscribe to the channel. This engagement really helps these conversations reach as many viewers as possible. Make sure to comment, I subscribed below, and I'll do my best to respond to each and every comment. My name is Chase Geyser, and I am one American.